Hello everyone, how are you today? You are all welcome back to my channel, Apostle Paul Taiwo YouTube channel, if today is your first time here, I want to say a very big thank you and God bless you. Endeavor to click on the subscription button and click on the notification icon so you can be notified whenever I drop a new video onto the channel or whenever I come up for prayers. I pray that this video you are about to listen to will bless your heart and bring you into repentance and strengthen your bonds with God and with His Holy Spirit in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. Endeavor to like this video and share it to your loved ones, God bless you. It's been hard to get this far, the devil has struggled in many ways to keep me from giving this testimony. I am from Rio de Janeiro. To see you here, the devil struggled but he lost because I am here. I had preached on Thursday and 54 souls were converted. Along the way, when I was in the city of Rizenji, in the state of Rio de Janeiro, there was an accident between a truck and a van. Just then I stopped the car and I rushed to help. There was an old gentleman. Pieces of metal were blocking his legs, another piece of iron was in his chest, I approached him, but I couldn't do anything, I couldn't move much, because there was wreckage everywhere. He looked at me and said, are you a believer? I am a pastor. I now want to come back to Jesus, because I feel the pain of death. I put my hand on him, I prayed for him and I announced to him what I received from the Lord. You will not die, you will even go and preach the gospel of Christ. Quickly help arrived. When he was already strapped to a stretcher, he raised his hand, thumbs up, looking at me. I had already felt the difference. He told me that it had been 22 years since he had strayed from God's path. My brothers, God has a plan for each of us. If he wants to bring us back to himself, he will do it one way or another, but we must not wait to be on the verge of death. Come back when you are healthy, to work for God. Whenever people were waiting for me in a church, because of what I've been through, people expected to see someone much older. I have been a pastor for more than 10 years. I have traveled to 12 countries and in all the states of Brazil. I have been preaching in every little corner of Brazil. I was best known in Brazil in 2004, after a debate and especially when I started to give my testimony. Now I live in the state of Rio, in a city where almost everyone is evangelical, those who are not, are children of believers. At the age of 16, I was already commander-in-chief on the scale of black magic. At that age, I had already dabbled in the Umbanda, Kimbanda, Candomblé, Voodoo, Fetishism, these are religions and mystical practices. I reached rank 33, which is the last rank in black magic. In 1982, I started working for Reed Globo, Brazilian television channel. I worked to consecrate their novellas, Brazilian soap operas, that is to say bless their series and miniseries in the name of Satan. I did several jobs for several people from Globo, for presenters and actors. I did work for Renato Aragao better known as Didi de Ostrapalios, humorous troupe. You don't know it, but Didi is in the second highest grade in black magic. He is a pope of black magic. He has that sweet appearance, but if you step on him you won't live long enough to tell what happened. He is a terrible instrument of Satan. He lives through satanic rituals to obtain prosperity and fame. I also worked for Shusha, actress, singer and presenter of children's programs. Her nickname translated in black magic means Oxum and Orisha, they are demonic entities. Shusha works with with Examirim. He is a small demon who dominates children in her TV programs, and in cartoons, they make children rebellious. It is these spirits that from childhood push little boys to be effeminate and to want to try lipstick for example. These spirits make little girls lesbians. Children are dominated by these spirits through television. 
Through these children's programs and cartoons, a satanic force is reaching homes. Not all of the monsters you see in these programs were created by chance. They actually exist in the spirit world before they are portrayed on TV. Lots of cartoons, not all of them, but several of them are dedicated in black magic rituals. I myself dedicated a cartoon on his arrival in Brazil, He-Man. There is a character in this cartoon, a flying figurine, which represents the Exum Kavira or the God of Death, in black magic. The opponent of He-Man, is called Escaleto. He is the issue of Death, the God of Death in black magic. The characters in these cartoons are not chosen at random. I also dedicated another cartoon on its arrival in Brazil, Thundercats in which there is an entity called Mumra. It is a Kabaklu from Angola. A Kablako is a white Indian mestizo, but in Umbanda, the Kaboklos represent an indigenous people who lived in the past and who were endowed with great intelligence. We can evoke their spirits, because they have become spirits, they are invoked for various reasons. When Mumra is transformed, he approaches a huge boiling pot. He stretches out his arms and evokes the old evil spirits. He evokes the first demons who came to earth. He transforms this old form, this decadent form into Mum-Ra and he then turns into a great demon. Then, two cobras grow on its head. On its chest is a cobra with two heads. Then he continues with a ritual where he turns and transmits a satanic word cursing children. Mum-Ra is a mummy who transforms into an evil spirit in the cartoon. At this moment he transmits a message, in the name of Lucifer, Prince of Darkness, I curse all those who look at me. This spirit disturbs the children, they no longer respect their parents and become restless. The satanic force is terrible. A cartoon that has been dedicated to Satan gives the power to entities to come to children and disturb them psychologically. They can cause a child to have the idea to kill his parents. There is a Kabaklu entity named Seven in Cruzeladas. It means seven crossroads in English. It is the entity that founded the Umbanda, mystical religion. This seven in Cruzeladas proceeds by means of a Pai de Santo. A Pai de Santo is a male priest of Umbanda, Candomblé, and Quimbanda, the Afro-Brazilian religions. In Portuguese those words translate as father of, the, Saint S, which is an adaption from the Yoruba language word Babalorisha, a title given to the African religion's priests. Seven in Cruzeladas is a very powerful entity, which serves to destroy people drastically. The Pai de Santo first conjures up the Seven in Cruzeladas. Then the Pai de Santo sends him to possess a determined individual and this person will kill the person or persons who are asked of him, the father, the mother, the children, whoever. Once the victim is killed, the perpetrator will swear until the end of his life that he did nothing wrong since it was the entity that used his body to do so. But God has raised an army. It is me and you to fight against the forces of evil. We must dedicate our lives to God. While you waste time on unnecessary leisure, souls are dying at the hands of Satan. Pray for the salvation of souls. You have the possibility through your prayers to not only protect yourself but to curb the harm done to people on the other side of the earth. So take the time to add a few sentences to your prayers for the salvation of souls. These people may not be Christians, they don't even know they can break free from this, they're lost and confused. I was doing jobs for important people in our country. I was working jointly with Tio Chico, known today as Pastor Francisco. He was the strongest black magic Pai de Santo in the state of Brasilia. I was with Tio Chico and five other Pai de Santo graduates in the high elite of black magic. It was the time when Tancredo Neves won the presidential election in 1985. The witchcraft drums resounded in Bahia, Recife, Brasilia and Rio de Janeiro to mystically finish him off. At the end of 15 days of ritual, Tancredo Neves the President of the Republic died because he could not withstand the pressure of the satanic forces which were produced to kill him. The politics we live in are dirty politics. Most politicians have a pact with black magic. For a senator to be elected, a vote is required. But in Brasilia, there are senators that we have never seen, we do not know their names or their numbers and no one voted for them, yet they are there. It is the same for certain federal deputies. These are people who work black magic in order to be elected and to become rich. There are people who don't like to vote for Christians. 
They don't like the idea that a man of God is in politics. They prefer to vote for Macumberos, practitioners of magic. In Rio, there was a new law, the law of silence. They shut down churches on the pretext that they are making noise. What about carnivals, and football games and all those pagan festivals that are in our country? Don't they make more noise? A Christian deputy fought alone, by the grace of God, and fortunately had this law annulled. My brothers, beyond the political consideration, when voting for your elected officials, place the men of God, this is necessary. Once in power these people will defend the interests of God and the church. The others you do not know what interests or for whom they work. I was Pai de Santo of the one nicknamed Cabeza, Fernando Collar de Mello, former president of the Republic, of Paulo Caesar Farias known as PC Farias. I was Pai de Santo for actors, actresses, etc. Today I work for Jesus of Nazareth. It is God who redeems man from the clutches of Satan. 2. My mother. I'm going to tell you about a tried person, my mother. I come from a family of pastors. I am the grandson of a pastor, Manuel Inacio da Silva. My grandfather was one of the pioneers of the Assembly of God in Recife. I am Sister Leah's grandson. My grandmother was one of the first leaders of the prayer circle in Brazil, founded in Casa Amarela. I come from an Assembly of God family. My mother was leading a big prayer circle in our city. She was known as a prophetess. People said she was a vessel of God. In 1968 my mother was pregnant with me. One day when she was in a prayer circle, someone gave her a prophetic revelation. A woman put her hand on my mother's belly, and she said, Woman, in your womb, there is a male. He will grow up and preach. My mother believed and kept this message in her heart. Time passed, and when I was five years old I was part of a church group called the Little Lambs of Christ, yet I was nothing like a lamb, I was rather a little wolf. I was the most terrible child in the church. I disrupted all worship, I knocked down musical instruments, people's Bibles, I ran into the church. When the porter, also in charge of security in the church, came to look for me, I hid under the pews of the church and I slipped between the legs of the faithful and he did not catch me. I was running here and there. No other child was having fun with me. I was terrible, a real plague. Most of the doormen were old, and couldn't control me. And one fine day there was a porter from another city. My uncle, the pastor of this church, asked him to be the church porter. He was very attentive to the slightest noise and as soon as a child started to run he rushed to restore order. A girl was wearing a flounce skirt. I pulled her skirt off and dragged the skirt to the floor. Fortunately for her, in the northeast, all the young girls wore petticoats. The porter witnessed the scene, he saw the young girl crying. He asked the second doorman who this uncontrollable child was. The second doorman told him, don't touch this child. His family is one of the most important here. His uncle is the pastor and his mother is leading the prayer circle. How is it that people in the church fear important families? In church, no one is more important than another, and no family commands another. The only person in charge there is Jesus. The other porter then replied, he may be the child of an important family, but this church does not belong to them, it belongs to Jesus. Now I am going to catch him and he will stop making a mess. This porter came there, and I was afraid. He asked me to take his hand and he pressed, and I threatened to tell my parents. He took me to the hallway of the church, pricked my ears. When I wanted to cry, he asked me to be silent. He told me that if I continued to cause disorder in the church, he would hit me. Go sit down and be quiet, he said to me. I turned into a little angel. This doorman worked Tuesday and Friday, and during those two days I was a real little angel. The other days, I continued to do whatever I wanted. Fortunately my son Jonathan doesn't misbehave like me today. He plays instruments in the church and sings while I was just the opposite when I was at his age. I had no friends, I often played alone. I was the child of my parents' old age. They gave me a lot of attention and forgave me for a lot of things. But it was a mistake because I was the most terrible of all their children and I did everything that the others had never done. One day while my uncle was taking a nap, 
He who defended me when people said I had a demon in me. He was sleeping and I saw that he had a lot of hair on his legs. I found it weird and I decided to remove his hair. I took kerosene from a lamp. I poured it while massaging her legs. My uncle woke up believing that I was massaging him. While I was spreading the oil, he fell back asleep. I went to get matches and set him on fire. My uncle stood up. It looked like a horror movie. He went running, screaming, desperate. He had second degree burns. He almost died. I had a bad spirit in me, I saw my uncle burned and I found it very funny. My mother came and helped him. My mom whipped me so hard that day. Then she took some corn which she spread on the ground and asked me to kneel on it for one hour. 3. The day everything changed. When my mother went to work, she would ask around who could look after me, no one wanted to. So that is how one day we both went to town to shop. She had to buy fabrics for the tables in the church. The sisters in the church loved my mother very much. People feared her, because she had revelations. When she passed by, people would say, it is her. This is the vessel through whom Christ speaks. But the Lord gave my mother a hard test. When we had already bought the fabrics, we were at the station waiting for the train to return. I had started running everywhere and I was hiding. I wanted to play hide and seek. I was hiding behind the door in the station toilets. My mother was looking for me because the train was ready to go. And as my desperate mother was looking everywhere for me, she saw a little boy in the distance on the train at the door. This boy had the same clothes and shoes as me. She thought it was me and she got on the train. The train closed its doors and was gone. Because of a game, I lost my mother's affection, I lost my family, I lost the opportunity to grow up in a Christian home, I lost everything. As I left this toilet, I saw that the train left taking with it the most important person in my life, my mother, the one who defended me against everything and everyone. For example one day my mother was going to milk a cow. I was around and I had a red shirt. The farmer who was there saw me go to my mother and asked me to change my shirt because cows don't like red. As stubborn as I was, I said, this is what we will see. I started to provoke the cows. When one of them saw me, it started to charge towards me. At that precise moment my mother saw, she ran towards me to prevent the cow from hitting me and she fell into the mud. In that mud there was a piece of iron that went through my mother's breast and one of the fence posts made her blind in her left eye. She fell there bleeding with one eye sticking out of it. My uncles arrived and I was paralyzed. My mom still ran to kiss me and asked if I was okay. And she said, thank God you're doing well. The only love the Bible compares to the love of God is the love of a mother. A mother normally loves her child more than her husband, more than her lover, more than anything. A woman of God loves her children supernaturally. When her children go out, the mother is never at ease. So I was alone in this station, I was crying. Once on the train she realized that the young boy was not me. My father was waiting for us at the other station. When she arrived, my father asked where his son was, my mother replied, I lost our boy. My father managed to find a car from the town hall and returned to Recife. They spent three days looking for me. Then they had to go home. My father spoke to my mother, you took away my joy of living, you took away my son. From today you are no longer my wife. As I told you, I was the son of my parents' old age. My parents were already old when I was born. I was the youngest, the one who was pampered and who often ends badly in life because from young I did not have the same education as my older brothers. I was shown too much love and few limits. I did not have the tools to move forward in life. I am rebellious, disobedient, contemptuous and selfish. But it is not my fault. It is because of the failure of my parents who defended me too much and gave me too much permission at home. The son of old age. My father took his license from the church. He tore it up and he said to my mother, as of today I'm not a believer either. And I don't want Christians to come to my house anymore. My father was revolted, he no longer spoke to my mother. She lost the respect of church members. Formerly admired, when she entered the church, people said, look, it is the irresponsible mother. She lost a six-year-old child. 
It is sure that this child is already dead. My mother would bow her head, kneel and cry, not only had she lost me, but she lost her husband, respect of the church, and people would laugh at her. When she went to the market, people out of spite asked her, O oh, sister in Christ, where is your son? Didn't you come with him? Didn't you say your son was coming home? It's been three years already. And my mother always answered, one day he will come back. My mother told me that she was crying in the street. He missed me very much. Meanwhile, I wandered the streets, ate in the garbage, ate rotten food. Sometimes there were already insects on it, but I ate to quench my hunger. One Friday night I was sleeping in the street. In Recife, it is hot during the day, but at night it is very cold because of the breeze coming from the sea. So I took a stray dog with me. I caught him for a little warmth, so I slept often with dogs. One day some men came and saw me with the dogs. They thought I was an animal rapist and they wanted to catch me to punish me. I heard that and I thought I was going to explain to them that I was using the dogs for warmth and sleep. When I got up, one of the boys kicked me, with his boots, which have an iron on the front. When his foot reached my face, the iron broke open my jaw. I still have the scar. He also broke my left jaw at the same time. I fell to the ground, I couldn't scream because my left jaw was open and visible. I got up to flee, and his friend took a brass knuckle. With that iron fist, he hit me where it was already open. I passed out. All night long, I stayed under a bench, bleeding. In the morning a young man who always passed by and gave me popcorn took me to the hospital as soon as he saw me. When the nurse began to sew my mouth, she asked who could have done this to such a young boy. The doctor said, a boy like this, must be one of those little thieves, sniffer of glue, he certainly stole someone's wallet and he was punished. Quickly finish sewing his jaw and put him outside, he stinks too much. I saw that in their eyes I was nothing, I was nobody, I did not exist. I was kicked out. I looked at the sky and I thought of my mother, I remembered what she said. She said that God gave bread and water to the people of the earth so that they would not die of hunger. It had been days since I had eaten. I couldn't eat anything, I had to drink soup or liquid food. But where was I going to find soup? I had no money. When it rained, I would take the mud and drink. I would go to the beach and take the rest of the coconut water that people had drunk. That was my soup. I spent nights hungry. I received a lot of beatings from little street children like me. 4. Woman Initiation One day I went to a welfare center believing I was going to be saved. But it was the biggest curse for me. A car stopped and a lady came out distributing soup to street children. I didn't know who she was. She was the most powerful Makumbara, Makumba practitioner, in the state of Parabuku. She was known as Tia Dinar, commander-in-chief of the High Black Magic Squadron. When I had lined up in the queue to receive the soup, she took me out of the line. Madam, you are not going to give me soup? Of course I'll do it. I'll take you out of the line, because you're a special child, you'll eat as much soup as you want. She gave me a lot of soup, then she asked me, why are you in the street? Don't you have a father, a mother? I have, but I got lost and I don't know how to get home. I told her the name of my city. She told me that she didn't know it. If you want I will take you home. I'll take care of you like a son. Is there food at your place? Yes, of course. Is there a bed to lay me down? Yes, of course. I'm coming. This is how I arrived in the biggest witchcraft center in Parabuku. She lived there, but it was also a big center, where she received politicians, Actors and actresses etc. Powerful people came there to make a satanic pact or ask for a mystical service. Tia Dinar, that's her name, said to me, I need you, you will be my substitute, I will teach you the art of magic. I began to know the strength of black magic. Now you no longer have a father and you no longer have a mother. But I have a father and a mother. No it's over, you don't have any more. I'm going to lock you in this room. You will go out only when you understand that you don't. She locked me in a dark room for 45 days. 
She only gave me food at 10 p.m. She slipped a strange bowl of salty soup under the door. I was so hungry that I ate. After 45 days, I couldn't remember having had a father or a mother. This memory was erased from my mind. She gave me spiritual treatment, a cleansing of my mind and my past was erased. After 45 days, I was already used to this soup. When I left the room, I asked her for it. She replied, go get some from the fridge. I went to the fridge and when I opened it there was no soup, there was only human blood. That was what she gave me with salt for 45 days. And because of that, I started to receive spirits. For another 7 days, she locked me in a development room to receive guides. The strongest guides are controlled by Babue, Babua, Babaria, and Babalarixis. Baba means father. They are priesthoods, leaders of worship centers of one of the Afro-Brazilian religions. These terms are used by followers of Candomblé which is a mystical religion. They are Pai de Santo from Angola, very powerful marabouts. When the Pai de Santo in this category perform rituals to kill someone, they can kill him in the next hour if God does not intervene. They can do a ritual to send leprosy, a disease, or make someone bankrupt. So Tia Dinar had locked me in a development room dedicated to Babalarixis when I was only a child. On the penultimate day, I was incorporated by guides that only high-grade Pai de Santos normally received. One night I received all the guides, which normally are only received gradually, every year in normal times. When I left this room, Tia Dinar immediately saw the number of guides I had received. She was afraid and she said to me, I'm going to send you to Bahia right away because you have received two strong guides and I do not work with them. You will have to go to Bahia to develop yourself with the Maimenanina do Cantua. I was staying seven to eight months there. She had taught me all the art of magic, all the control of satanic power, all the strength of black magic. When that was finished, she said to me, you will lead 27 high-grade black magic cults. Do not accept any humiliation from any human being. At that time I was doing jumps 3 meters high. I was taken to a beach called Velmar, and that's where I started jumping. I didn't know what it was for. I think the Santo Pai wanted to know what spirit was incorporated in me at the time. I was possessed by an exum which gave me this supernatural strength. Possessed by this entity, I could kill any man that challenged me. People started to fear me and I was then known in Parabuku as the little boy from hell the youngest Pai de Santo in the state of Parabuku. From then on, I started to do major works. In 1982, I got to know Roberto Marino, president of the Globo Group, now deceased. The May de Santo said to me, I'm going to introduce you to someone very powerful. If he likes you, he will want you to work for him. I was doing a ritual for him, and he appreciated it. He then hired me to dedicate his novellas, Brazilian soap operas. 5. My first work. I am going to show you transport tickets on which are printed notices of missing children. It is written there, missing child. This child, Fabiano, disappeared when he was 13 years old in 1996. At 13 years old don't you think that Fabiano could tell the competent authorities what is the name of his father and his mother? Can't he tell the name of his neighborhood or the city in which he lives? The answer is yes. So why isn't he home? Why has it been so long and no one can find him? I will explain and give you the reason. But first look at this other ticket, where Tachiane who disappeared in 1992 was also 13 years old. There are several of these papers like this, people who disappeared and never came home again. You know why? These people do not get lost they are kidnapped to be sacrificed in black magic rituals. I now want to alert everyone who watches the novellas. Before recording a novella, there is a satanic ritual. The novella is offered to a kabaklu called Kabaklu da Orisha. The Kabaklu da Orisha claims six children as a sacrifice. We tie the child's feet, the arms. We put him on an altar. Underneath there is a receptacle. We take a dagger of trunk Arua, name of a spirit, and we pierce the heart of the child. When you take out that dagger, you press so that there is pressure and blood comes out. The child struggles on the table until death. Then we remove his blood, his flesh, 
his bones, which we burn like incense to the Kabaklu de Orisha. The same process is repeated, with five other children. The novella is said to be consecrated. The actors of the novella are part of the ritual, and then the novella is broadcast, with terrible power. On Judgment Day, the Pai de Santa will pay for their actions. The actors and actresses who took part in this will answer for all of this before God. It is for these reasons that one should never watch the novellas again because now that you know these things, you become accomplices. It is not something essential to your lives. There are people who don't lose an episode, and when they're not home, they record. What fidelity! Yet there are Christians who do not have this same loyalty to God, who do not devote their time to God. It is because of your watching these novellas that these children are disappearing. You did not know it? Certainly. But from today you know it. Nothing on television captivates as much as a series. You can know someone who is very nice and very calm. But when she's watching her show, try turning off the television a bit and you'll see her reaction. It seems that 60% of women become adulterous as a result of these soap operas. The actresses project adultery and promiscuity in these stories. Then the women at home feel that their own life is bland and unsatisfying. Yes, these shows make people unfaithful. So consecrating novellas to Satan was my first job, and I got to know the actors, these famous people. I knew Renato Aragao. He hired me to do a job for him. I did and he paid me. And I had gone to offer this money as an offering to Yemangja, the queen of the sea on a beach called Boa Viajame, in Recife. When I brought her this offering, she materialized and she said to me, I don't want anything you brought me here. And what do you want? I want blood. What kind of animal? I don't want animal blood. I want human blood. I don't want a man's blood. I want a woman's blood. I want you to go back and bring me a 15-year-old girl. You will stab her seven times here in the sea. I will drink her blood and I will eat her flesh. I came out of the sea looking for a 15-year-old girl. Know that when you leave your house, the devil is watching you. Wherever you go, the devil is watching you, be sure of this. Do you know why he can't do anything to you? Because an angel with a flaming sword is guarding you. He can't do anything against you. The Bible says in Psalm 34 7, the angels of the Lord, encamp around those who fear him and delivers them. That is why the devil cannot take you. You just need to be faithful and obedient to the Lord for the angels of the Lord are there. Here I am looking for the 15 year old girl. I was in front of a college, and I was waiting for the classes to end. There a multitude of young people came out and I spotted a girl whose age I estimated at 15 years in relation to her class. I began to follow her to a street where there weren't a lot of people and I quickly parked my car. I got out, grabbed her by the neck and threw her in the car with her things so as not to leave any traces. I set off towards the beach of Boa Viajame, for the sacrifice. This girl had to die for Renato Aragao to have more success and more money. When I arrived at Boa Viajame beach, this girl was almost passed out. But a police patrol car passed by and she started screaming. I was scared, but I still managed to grab her neck so that she passed out again. When I parked the car, she came out the back door and started running and leaving me behind. Fortunately for me she was not running towards the city center, otherwise someone could have seen her. She had run to the beach. And this Boa Viajame beach is very wide. Very quickly, I caught up with her. This young girl was white-skinned. Her eyes were red. She had cried so much. She was desperate with the fear of death and I had this dagger in my hands. If you run, I will open your arm and you will bleed into the water. It is better that you come quietly. I will kill you quickly and you will not even feel the pain of death. This young girl was desperate, she was afraid of losing her life, her future. I was the devil's instrument, so killing her meant nothing to me. I approached her to grab her and carry her into the sea but she took a step back and raised her hand. I thought she wanted to fight so I approached her again and she shouted very loudly, Satan, by the power of the name of Jesus I cast you out now. At that moment a strong light came out of the girl and made me fall. I had my spirits in my body and I had fallen to the ground. I looked at the girl above me. 
She was red and surrounded by light and cried out to me again, Young man, I tell you, I belong to the Lord who is the creator of heaven and earth. I couldn't move anymore, the spirits inside me were paralyzed. The girl is gone. I don't know if she herself saw that light that was in her, I don't think so. I finally got up. She was already far away. As I got into my car, I told myself that she must be a maid de santo, and that I was going to kill her in a ritual. I called several very strong Pai de Santo, powerful marabouts, to help me in the ritual. We had done the ritual and there I sent a spirit to kill her at her place. But the spirit never returned. So I did another ritual, I sent Eshu Kavira. He was gone and came back. He materialized among us and I asked him, did you kill the girl? No I didn't kill her and I can't kill her. I can't even touch a single strand of her hair. Is she more senior than me? No, I can't kill her because she belongs to God. If you belong to the Lord God, the supreme and terrible being, the devil cannot make any attempt on your life, for God is on your side. So be obedient, watch your life, for things happen that you cannot even imagine. I was a wizard, I had killed, and the only time I had failed was with this real Christian. God gives you victory and frees you from the hands of Satan. I was outraged by this failure, I telephoned the May Menininia in Bahia to ask her what was going on. I told her this story and she asked me, what did the spirit tell you? He told me that the girl is a Christian and that he could not kill her. But you stayed eight months here with me, I told you several times, that you cannot do any work against the real Christians. But what is the problem? She's human, isn't she? Yes but their God does not allow witchcraft to reach them. Do you remember when I told you that you could become the greatest Babalariksa? So stop looking for Christians. And if I don't stop? So you're going to die. But who's going to kill me? The God of Christians. Yet you told me that my guides protect me from everything and everyone. But not from him. He can destroy you in less than a second despite your guides. When someone asks you to do a death ritual, find out who the target person is before starting the rituals. If he or she is a practicing Christian, refrain from doing it because the spirits that live in you will be destroyed and will cause your death. Fifteen days later, a young girl looked for me, saying, they told me you were doing death jobs, I wanted to kill a woman. What did she do to you? She didn't do anything, but she's with a man I'm in love with. Are you dating him? Yes I'm going out with him but she is the man's wife and I want to kill her to keep him. Do you have money? Yes no matter how much it takes, I'll pay. Bring me a picture of the girl and find out what her religion is. Okay. She brought me the picture and to find out about the religion of this woman, I asked her, so what religion does she belong to? That's not what you think at all. She doesn't attend any, mystical, center. She's not made to santo, or any of that, she's a poor woman. Yes, but I want to know what religion does this poor woman belong to as to whether I can kill her. These are the kind of poor women who go to church. Then you have to find another Macumbero, wizard, to kill her. Why? I told you she has no protection, she doesn't see a santo pie, she doesn't wear any charms on her, so she is accessible. This poor woman as you say, I am not able to kill her. Her God does not allow entities to enter her life to kill her. Make no mistake my brothers, do not practice any ritual, do not go and consult anyone except your God. Whatever you need, ask God yourself. Ask yourself, what does the Bible say about this? You have to lock yourself in your room and talk to God and He will be there. Do you think you can consult marabouts, listen to advice from people who practice magic, and after this, come kneeling before the Lord? Do you think you are protected? Choose your side, be faithful to God and He will be faithful to you. So I had stopped working against Christians. It was also at this time that I dedicated the novella Tieta du Agreste. It was a period when certain crimes that I had committed had been discovered. The people, kidnappers, who worked for us bringing us children had been imprisoned. They disclosed the name of the center and myself. The federal police came to pick me up. I had to be put in the high security prison of the state of Parabuku, because prisoners wanted to kill me, 
because they had learned that I was sacrificing children. I was sent to Sao Bernardo prison in Alagoas. But Sao Bernardo newspapers and television revealed that, the biggest child eater of Parabuku arrives in town, the Pai de Santo Menino do Inferno, a terrible macumbero, sorcerer. All the prisoners were waiting for me to kill me. The population was in revolt. The police car I was in, was pelted with stones. I was 20 at the time, and I wondered what I had done to the people to make them want to kill me. I was placed in an isolated cell. When I was sent out for a walk, I received beatings from all sides from the other prisoners. Once while I was queuing for lunch, a prisoner came with a dagger and said, Macumbero, you are going to die right away. He thrust the dagger in my stomach and the blade went to lodge itself in my spine. When he pierced me he was still moving the dagger, telling me that I was going to die, then when he removed the dagger from my stomach, the blood started to squirt and I had collapsed on the ground. The other prisoners approached and started kicking me in the head. The guards had been slow to arrive, hoping that I would die. Even I didn't understand why I wasn't dying. The blows were raining down. I was not dead because of the promise of God when he announced it to my mother in the womb that I was going to be a great preacher. God is faithful and true. I was stabbed eight times in all. Over the next few days, I continued to be beaten. I called the maid de Santo, when are you going to get me out of here? I cannot get you out of there. Since you confess the crimes, you will stay there. I spoke to everyone, to the governor, but there are no solutions for you. We're going to have a meeting with the Babalarixis and we'll see what we do with you. The meeting had taken place, and they said that I had been involved with too many Christians. It had disturbed the functioning of their centers. They said, we will expel him from magic. He will stay in prison. Let him die there. When I heard it on the phone, she said, I have bad news to tell you. Speak. You have been expelled from magic, you are no longer a member. And now? Now it's up to you to get by on your own. But you know, however, that I have no one, I have neither father nor mother, the only person I have is you. You are my mother. I was never your mother, you entered alone by yourself, and you will remain alone. 